It's an important fact that trust increases the power of your organization substantially. In fact, Harvard Business Review states that organizations that have high levels of trust have 106% more energy and 50% more productivity. One simple way to increase trust is by increasing your level of listening. And that's exactly what today's guest is all about. Welcome to the Level Up Leader Podcast. I'm your host, Michael King. I'm an executive coach and founder of Teams.Coach. I work with C-level leaders to clarify and expand the vision, elevate their performance, and level up their leadership. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Jeremy Miller. Jeremy is the Vice President of Enterprise Development for Poly, and he's an also all-around great guy and a great leader. So please welcome Jeremy Miller to the podcast. Today, uh, I'm super pumped for you to meet this leader. His name is Jeremy Miller. He is the vice president of enterprise development for a company by the name of Poly. So he's going to share a little bit about that. He has some military experience uh, with the Marine Corps. He's got 23 years in sales, small business owner for 15 years. He's got some amazing kids. It sounds like he's the 21, 19, 17, and 15. So somewhere... Uh, you got pretty busy uh, starting yeah. to replicate. So that's amazing. Um, but man, thank you so much for, for joining today. Um, so tell us a little bit more about you. What, what makes you tick? Uh, you know, uh, people. <laughs> so, you know, I, I feed off of people. I feed off their energy. Um, I, I think what makes me tick is just uh, doing things I love to do. And that's that's just making people better and and making company thrive and um, it's funny because, you know, from the day that I started in even in the Marine Corps, when I was 17 years old, I've always I've always had that need for recognition. Right. Like I always wanted to be the best. I always wanted to be number one. I re can remember being 18, 19 years old and getting my proficiency in conduct marks. And, you know, the, the perfect Marine was 5 0 and. And I, I was usually, you know, a four eight, four nine, like proficiency conduct. And then I remember one time I got like a four six, four seven, and I, I thought it was the end of the world, right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So just from from the time I was young, I I, um, I got to do some ex, ex, you know extraordinary things as a young man in the military, and I credit a lot of my success and disciplines and things from from that experience. Um, you know, I was a twenty one year old sergeant in the Congo, uh, in in Africa, in Zaire, and. Um, I got a son now that just graduated high school who's 19 and I'm like, man, what, how did I do it? <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, you know, I, I see where I was at at 19. And I see where he's at. And, and I think, you know, some of it's just a little bit of upbringing difference, right? You know, I grew up uh, in West Virginia. It's where I live and I grew up in a coal miners home and um, mom and dad, you know, they, they didn't have much, but they always provided. And, you know, they always made sure that yeah, I never wanted for anything. Um, but I always wanted more, but I, I never had to really want for anything, but I always knew there was something more to, to have, you know, and maybe it's just possession type stuff, but I was always driven by some of that. So, um, yeah, yeah. So it is good. And, and, you know, I got in the car business after the, after the Marine Corps and started out selling cars and, Worked my way to finance and sales manager and then general sales manager and worked up to general manager position. I was up in the northern uh, West Virginia, Pittsburgh market um, and just uh, really excelled at it. And, and what it boiled down, I was just good with people. I, I was always honest. And, you know, I always say, like, sometimes, you know, delivering bad news or telling a customer, sorry, you can't buy a car because your credit's bad or I can't get to that payment on that car. Um, that, that it was always just kind of hurt inside a little bit delivering that news to people, which I believe was just yeah. a real, real way of just being empathetic, right? Because wanting them to have something that you, you know, like you can't control. And uh, so, and then after it was funny, I got, I actually got the car guys will laugh at this because I, I actually um, took a credit application. This is back when you used to have to handwrite things, right? Back, you know, twenty. Right, right. Years. <laughs> I was taking a credit application on an insurance agent. I won't say what company he was with, but um, one day and I asked him what his gross monthly income was. And he, uh, he told me, and I kind of looked up like, okay, yeah, well, seriously, what, what's your gross monthly income? Ha ha ha. Funny. He goes, no, that's what I really make. I'm like, wait a second. You make this much money and 
you you're home every holiday you're home you're home for the birthdays you you know you don't work weekends and he's like exactly nine months later i was an insurance agent <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. uh, so, yeah, that's so exactly that's how, how that works right yeah so that's how i transitioned from uh the auto business to the insurance business and um I had some great great success as a small business owner working for another company and then uh, in January, as recent as January, I, I got offered a position here at Poly, and man, it just, I fell in love with it because it allowed me to marry my two experiences. So I was able to take my experience in the car business for those 10 years. And then my experience as an insurance agent, and I was just able to like, they just married together and I could walk into a dealership and, and you'd think I worked in a dealership because I could, I could speak their language. I understand their pain points. And, and then from the insurance perspective, understanding why things are the way they are in the insurance. So I always describe the, the car business is like, it's very gray, right? You can, you can, you can get creative putting deals together in a car business it's called, you know, it's like that creative writing class when you're in dealership with insurance it's very black and white, it's regulated. So you can't get creative in the insurance world. So when the two when the two of them collide, you know it's great to have people with both experiences to understand. Okay, I know what you're thinking. I know you want to pay the premium out of the car deal gross so that this car can go down the road, but the Department of Insurance really doesn't want you to do that. <laughs> we we can't do that. So, um, so anyway, so that's 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 me in a nutshell, man. In in, in a, you know a couple minutes, but it's it's been a great journey. You talk about my kids. I mean, they're yeah, they're they're fantastic and. Um, I've just been very blessed to have uh, a very supportive family. As a matter of fact, we'll we'll probably be fishing on Greenbrier River here in West Virginia this weekend for Labor Day. So, um, oh, love so, it! Yeah, yeah, two daughters, two sons, and uh, you know, I can't can't complain at all about it. So. That's awesome. Um, what I'm loving about kind of getting doing this format um, of diving into doing some podcasts with leaders is um, I love to to hear people's stories, um, kind of where they came from. But I also I love experiencing people's energy, and I love the energy that you bring to the table. You uh, just kind of like in our pre interview, you were telling me that you just got done traveling and going uh, around to your to your different dealerships. You said you had 1,200 rooftops that you're mm-hmm. visiting, um, and making sure that uh, you know finding out what's actually happening, boots on the ground type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that. Um, I, there was a season where I went and um, so while I started off doing uh doing leadership through, uh, through ministry. And um, when I went back to school to get my master's, I, I actually ended up being a finance uh, manager for a while at, a, at an auto dealership. So um, I remember when I actually started to transition out of, um, I started to turn the blinker on with my GM to let him know like, Hey, I just want to let you know, like one of my personal goals was as, as soon as I'm making this amount of money in my coaching business, I'm bowing out of the finance business of working at the car dealership. And I remember that I gave him about maybe about a four month notice to let him know like, Hey, just want to let you know, um, Come, come November 15th, I am done. I just want to let you know, like I'm done. And the finance managers at that, at that specific dealership, they were making so much money that he did not believe me. He was like, you're not, you're not going to quit this job. Yeah. You're not going to leave, you know, you're but my why was, yeah, exactly. It's like, no, but my, my why was strong enough. He, what he didn't know is that every single dime that I'd made from working in the car industry, I'd actually put into my company. Oh, wow. Like, so I wasn't living off that money. Like I was literally just dumping it into going, okay, uh, this is how much I need for my first five years of operation. So this is my financial goals. Like, so let's rock, let's go. Um, And I know that God used that situation of like, you know, of me being able to pause the world, work in my education, get exposure to leaders at a completely different level, but also some experiences to get me connected with real life, real people Mm -hmm. um, in order for me to elevate what I was doing. And I couldn't be more grateful for that. Um, but you're the exact type of leader that I want to talk to. Um, you, you have from all the way from, you know, uh, West Virginia, Marine Corps, you know, car dealership, insurance agency, poly, there's something that's been going on inside of you to where you have leveled up all the way across the board. And I, 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 I have a really good sense that you have some, you have gratitude in your heart and you really like to, uh, experience next level things for the people that you serve. Mm-hmm. Um, can you, I want to talk to you about these three specific questions. But the first one, what is one leadership superpower, one leadership tip that you feel like that you put in play that's unique to you that you see working really well? Um, 
it's it's funny you ask that because I honestly like I, I read constantly reading books and um but I, I think I think for right now in the climate and just in the just the industry in the country the you know the labor market I think it's so easy as leaders sometimes to lead from a from a from a calendar lead from a um, an Excel spreadsheet and and not really understand what's going on. And, and I think, I think, you know, I used to, we used to call them armchair generals, right? Like in the, in the military, yeah. like, you know, the guy that tells you to go do something that wouldn't think twice of doing it himself. Um, I never, I never want to report to that guy. And so that's, yeah. that's what I don't want to be. I don't ever want to be that armchair general. That's like up here looking at, looking at the stats going, Oh, you're doing a terrible job. You know, I need to know why, it is what it is. And and that's what I've actually, you know, last eight weeks, I've been on the road pretty hard. I've, I've probably been into like 60, 60 plus rooftops um, and dealerships and, you know, just to help my clients. But really it's, it's just so my field team knows that, you know, I care, the company cares. Like we, you know, we sort of, uh, you know, I listen to a, a lot of podcasts and there's one in particular where they talk about like um, leading, leading out a crisis. And you don't really think about the pandemic. Like, you know, we kind of like shrug it off. Yeah. I had my COVID It lasted three or four days. It wasn't really a crisis for me, you know, like, but I mean, people experienced some real, like there was a lot of traumatic crisis for families that lost people and uh, jobs and relocations. There was a lot. And as a leader, you got to sit back and say, okay, yeah, my family all had COVID. We were over it like in a week and that was it. Like it, we didn't have really a crisis from, but there was a lot of people that suffered that way. And then understanding the industries, right? The auto industry is, is so different post pandemic than it was pre pandemic, right? It's, it's entirely word. different. Yeah. yeah. So, so leading, leading through that, that those crises uh, is, is like crazy um, right now, because I think the biggest, I guess the takeaway, and it's not, it's not like it's a, it's a hidden secret, but it's just showing your people that you care. I I've been reading a book um, called leaders eat last. Right. And, um, yep. by Simon uh, Sanic and and it opens up and it, it grabbed me it grabbed me because it's always that first few chapters of a book that or the first few pages of a book whether I know I'm going to put it down and never read it again and his book opened up with that military story you ever read the book leaders eat last you ever have you ever read that yes I have yes yeah so it opens up with that story of that a10 pilot that's up there above the clouds right and you know he just had this gut feeling something wasn't right and he comes down out of the clouds you know and it's just like that's as leaders, sometimes we got to come down out of the clouds. We got to get out of the towers, get out of the office and just go out there and see what's really happening before we start making like judgment calls about, because sometimes it, it's like, wow, we got this all wrong from our level. Like we're, and, and so that's, that would be my nugget is just really just come down out of the clouds and, and show your people that you care and that you'll roll your sleeves up and, and work with alongside them, you know? So. Yeah. I, I love that. Um, on your on your on your show notes when you when you submitted them you actually said uh you actually worded it that lead from weeds not from trees exactly and <laughs> and i i love that um that's going to be that's going to be a quotable for this so i i think that's absolutely absolutely brilliant um and you shared a little bit some stories of some ap, ap, applications as far as you know how you do that is there anything else you'd like to add is there any any specific story that stands out to you you know i mean uh, right now there there's just there's from from the time of of beginning my and I I think we're all like I I think we're all kind of born leaders I think it's in all of us it's just we excuse our personalities sometimes to um to not run with that or I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert like yeah I'm a, I'm a total extrovert I don't meet a stranger ever and I think you know just from from a a story perspective is just is really just um. I think sometimes we, we want to, we want to respond. I I had a great, great example this past week meeting with a client where, you know, he was kind of, I thought the meeting was going to go like in a very positive way. I I went in with like a, with an agenda of like the things we were going to discuss and very quickly and very candidly, the client kind of let me have it. (laughs) Wow. and I wasn't pre- like, I did not prep for that type of meeting. I, in my mind, I, I mean, it was just like a total like sucker punch from behind. And I mean, he was very light and respect, but I, I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, like I was kind of like, you know, if you get punched sucker, you know, get punched drunk for a second, like <laughs> what just happened? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and it is so, so true. And I think our response, my response to that, I just had to be very honest and open with him in that moment. I think season just being seasoned because of 
the first thing you want to do is get defensive, right? And and yeah. you want to get defensive and say, no, it, it, you you could do this better. And I just I had to look at the client and say, I I could machine gun some responses right now that I, that probably would sound really well, like that you would probably be satisfied with the responses, but I don't know that they're the responses that that warrant your concerns. So give me give me a week to get back with you on your concerns. And he's like, oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, but the younger me would have just, you know, I would have just rattled off all kinds of, you know, all, all the things I think he wanted to hear. And, the, but the, the more seasoned leader in me said, let's not tell him what you think he wants to hear. And let's, let's just tell him the truth and get, get a few days to do that. <laughs> so, I love it. I love it. Now, um, now coming out of, you know, we are coming out of, out of, you know, post pandemic COVID um, if there is ever going to be such a thing ever again, I don't, I'm not quite sure, but um, what do you feel like is the biggest leadership or business hurdle that you're experiencing today? You know, I, I, I think it's just the, and you and I talked a little bit before we went live, but um, it's understanding what, what makes, what makes the labor force tick right now? Cause you know, for a couple of years, a lot of people got to sort of we've we've got to kind of sit in our bedrooms and get on our Teams calls and our Zoom calls and and call our clients. And uh, you know, I was working for a company prior to Poly, and you know, they, I was getting a lot of, "Hey, man, you're a rock star. You're doing a great job." And I was dying on the vine. I'm like, I suck. Like, I'm sitting in a, I'm doing a Teams call. Like, I, this does not like. But I was sucking better than everybody else, I guess. But I, you know, but I was, you know, I was like, I, this is not me. And uh, I'm a very relational. Like, you, you know, we we talked about, you know, what 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 gets me going and it's people. Right. And I mean, I, yeah. I can do this, like what we're doing right now, like an hour or so a day, but to do eight, 10 hours a day, every day, it's just like, um, so I think, you know, the, the labor force, I uh, had a friend of mine uh, sent me an article last week. It was called quiet quitting. And it's kind of talking about this Gen Z, this, there's the drive, right? Like, you know, when, when I started out on commission only in 1999, you know, commission only was like, Oh my gosh, are you crazy? Right. And, but I understood that in order to, you know, to make extra, I had to work harder. I had to make that extra phone call. I had to go out and greet a person. Maybe if I would had a, you know, if I had a sandwich in my hand, I'm about to eat lunch, I'm starving. And there's a customer pulls up, I put the sandwich down, wash my hands and run out and shake their hand because they may be the only customer I could speak to that day. So it's like, okay, do I eat my sandwich now or do I sell a car now? Like, you know, so, um, but I, I guess to answer your question, it's, it's really just managing through the labor force and, and trying to figure out how, what may, what motivates people? Like what motivates your team? It may, it may be, ex, it may be giving them every other Friday off if they hit certain goals or, you know, and we have to be open to that, you know, cause we come from a, I come from a culture of, you know, if you don't work 68 hours a week, you don't work, you didn't work, you know, I don't think it has right. to be that way. I, I think, I think if, if you can do the, if you can do that work in 30 hours a week and it's great and you're performing well, I'm, I'm cool with that. It's just, I feel like, I feel like uh, there's an expectation that we reward for lack of results, maybe. <laughs> um, so really figuring out what, what, what motivates, what drives them. And you know, one of the biggest things I, I re also read a book um, it's called uh, radical canter. I don't know if you've ever read that, but it, but it's a great book, yeah. but it talks about really getting to know your people and like knowing your team and knowing like, are they, you know, who are they married? Are they happy? Are they, or do they have kids where they live? What excites them? What? So as you create these contests or you create pay plans or you create, um, these incentives, you try to create it around kind of individualizing some of that. So I love that. Um, now as you know, some of the big takeaways that I'm having, even just even having these aha moments during this conversation too, is that it's so easy for us to get caught up into trying to measuring, um, the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, again, outcomes are always more important than your system and your, your strategies that aren't working for you. Um, and I would say that, you, you know, a, a, that's probably one of the biggest th things that I'm in working with leaders on is that sometimes leaders, they get caught in the gap of um, making sure that you're checking the right number of hours that your team members are working. 
uh, mm -hmm. and making sure that everybody is in compliance with the systems and strategies that you put into place. But at the end of the day, is is everything that you've designed actually giving you the results that you want? Mm -hmm. And um, I like what you just said there. I, I like the idea of like, there has been this massive cultural shift. In fact, probably one of the big motivations of the great resignation has simply been, we don't want to do it this way anymore. Mm -hmm. Like we have enough pain to cause us to change. So mm -hmm. let's just not do this like this anymore. Right. And, um, and so I think that we're, I think we're experiencing a lot of that. And I think that these are good things unless you're not willing to adapt into change. If you're not willing to adapt into change, then you're going to become a relic pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh or yeah. You just won't have a workforce. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. man, well, I loved, I loved our conversation today. Um, how can people reach you and get in touch with you? You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very reachable. They'll be welcome. It's just Jeremy Miller, my first and last name at poly.co. You can email me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and you know, I'll be glad, like I said, I, <laughs> It was it was a it was a humbling for you to ask me to be part of this, like because I you know I always think, you know, what do I got to offer, right? <laughs> I, mean, I feel like I'm learning every day uh, still. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm 46 years old, and uh, you know I have to sometimes still back and be like, you know, I'm, I'm even if, if I live to be 80 some, I'm still like I still got half my life to live, right? So there's still a lot to learn. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn, my email, I, you know, I'll be I'll be glad to uh, connect and respond, and if you have questions or comments or you think I'm a crazy man? I mean, you can say that too. So. <laughs> no, I I've love been, it. I've and been I, called I, worse. <laughs> well, you come from the car industry, so I can guarantee you've been called worse. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've, yeah. I've, uh, I've been there. I've experienced it. So um, man, well, I, I, I appreciate you very much for doing this. And, uh, you know, again, some of the best leaders are the ones that aren't looking for platforms. And I, that's what I appreciate about you. You're authentic, you're sincere, you're real, and you're willing to get, um, as you would say, lead from the weeds and not just from the trees. So um, thank you so much for making time uh, for me today. And um, I can't wait to see kind of what's up, what's next for you. So we'll- Thanks, we'll, Michael, we'll so much. Tabs on you, okay? Yeah. And I, and you keep doing what you're doing, man. It's, it's encouraging to guys like me, like I was telling you before the the, the call, like uh, as you scroll through some, some negative news, it's always encouraging to see your posts and your videos and, and, and some of your advice and, and it doesn't go unnoticed. I may not like or comment or, you know, send you a pom-pom <laughs> emoji or anything, but, but it's being watched. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm looking for the pom-pom emoji. So thank you for joining us today on the Level Up Leader Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us to get the word out and make sure to like, subscribe, and to follow. So that way you'll get all of our content. I love that Jeremy gets his team. He understands that understanding and listening are superpowers of leaders who drive results. He also understands that you can't fake this. You have to care authentically. When it comes to trust, it can easily be gained. Even more, it can be easily lost. I wanted to give a special thank you to our featured artist, Names Without Numbers, for allowing us to use their music. Now we've decided that we only wanted to use music that I've actually produced in the studio for this podcast, so I think that's pretty cool. To find out more about everything we're up to, check us out at www.teams.coach and don't forget to join our Facebook group at teams.coach slash leveluploaders. 